by far the most popular kind of video that I upload to YouTube are my dash cam reviews. Now I've always got a dash cam fitted into my own car to capture moments like this. But I'm now also getting a 10% discount on my insurance. I just took out a new policy recently that was the cheapest anyway, and then I got a further 10% discount for having a dash cam fitted in my car. Now, the dash cam I'm using in this car is a Mobius with an extended lens. Bit of a janky solution. Most people wouldn't be prepared to mess around with this, and for some people, it doesn't actually work when they extend the lens. So it's not ideal for everyone, but it works for me. What's more appropriate for most people would be a Mini 0801. It's a very popular and affordable mini dash cam with a built-in LCD screen and a handy mounting system. Now this year the 0803 has come out and a lot of people want to know is the new 0803 better than the old 0801? And the answer is a resounding yes. But if you need proof then it's on screen now. The low light performance of the new camera is a big improvement compared to the previous model. It's the main area where there is a big improvement. There are other subtle differences, but low light performance is the one area where the new camera really excels over the previous model. Now, for some people, that'll be all they'll have needed to see, and for those people, go and buy one from the link in the video description. But if you want to know more about the 0803 and a little bit about dash cams in general, then stay tuned. Now, there's a few things that all dash cams have in common. They all automatically start recording when they receive power and stop recording when the power is switched off. They all split the recordings up into segments of a few minutes in length and they all loop over the oldest footage. So there's no need to manually delete the card when it's full. Now for those things to work, you'll need a few things in your car. You'll need a 12 volt power socket. I think they call these accessory sockets or sometimes lighter sockets, but you plug the power into that and it has to be off when the car is off. When you switch the car on, the power should go to your 12 volt lighter socket and therefore turn on the camera and it'll start recording. And then when you stop the car engine, the power gets disconnected from the 12 volt socket and the camera stops recording. Now the way the camera records is like this. Imagine that this car is a five minute video clip and this step is a memory card. Okay, so as you start driving to work, you start accruing little five minute clips. You're driving to work, you've got a five, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes of journey. You've got five clips of five minutes each. You then start driving home in the evening. Uh, luckily you get home a little bit quicker. You've got a 20 minute journey made up of four five minute clips. Next morning you set off to work. Right, the card's full now, what happens? Well, nothing to worry, the oldest clip gets deleted and the current journey just carries on being recorded over the oldest clips. So in this case, as far as this step goes, you've got 55 minutes worth of video. The last 55 minutes that you drove in the car is always on the card. So hopefully that's preempted a few of the more common questions and we can now get on and have a look at the camera itself. The headline features are on the front of the box and if we get inside the camera is in the top there. Put that to one side, in the bottom are the accessories. Laid out from left to right we've got the instruction booklet, the power lead, the windscreen mount and a spare adhesive, a USB data transfer lead and the camera itself. Now if we just look at that uh, power lead to start with, it's 10 foot long just under, that's 3 meters. It's got a micro USB on the end of that. This is the windscreen mount. This is a clever little thing. The USB plugs into there. We've got the spare adhesive for the back. I've got a video showing you how to remove those if you want to as well on my channel. And there's the USB, which is for data transfer directly off the camera itself. But we don't really need that. What we're gonna do, we'll plug the camera into this mount, just take off the protective coating off the screen there. Now the way it goes in, it clicks in the top here and that connects the camera to the USB plug, which then gets led around your car and put into your lighter socket. Now, one thing with these, on the previous video, I didn't demonstrate the amount of twist that you could have on this. So here we go, 45 degrees. You see that's maximum in that direction, maximum in that one. Some people thought you could stick one to your windscreen and point it into the car. You can't, unfortunately. Also, you've got to be careful with your mounting because once you've stuck it, you can't adjust it uh, sort of horizontally or vertically. You've got to get it just right the first time, but you can twist it up and down to get the horizon right. Now we've got three buttons on the right hand side here with an LED below those. On the bottom we've got the micro SD card slot, HDMI out. 
on the front there we've got a lens with a little bit of a protective coating over it remember to remove that otherwise it'll affect your video quality some of those holes are vents on the front there some's a speaker and on the top here there's a little tiny hole on the left there that's a microphone hole in the middle we've got an av out uh, standard AV and a micro USB plug. On this end there's the power on off but of course it automatically switches on and off that's just if you take it out of the car. So that's it, a nice small unit, uh, exactly the same as the previous model in fact. It doesn't really feel any different, I'm not too sure whether they've done anything to the casing whatsoever or just put new internals in it, but there you go, that's the old one and the new one, they look identical. Now if we plug in the micro USB plug into the top here, you see the light comes on, it turns on, you get the splash screen, and uh, at the top you'll see a little red indicator it's started recording and also the indicator at the bottom right is flashing blue and red so that's what happens you power it up starts recording automatically now you see there's a few little bits of information along the top of the screen there about what mode you've got how the battery is things like that if we press ok here it will stop recording and if we press it again it'll start recording it's nice and responsive now we can get into the menus by pressing the top button and holding it down and that will get us into the different uh, settings menus and I'll just show you how many of these there are. They're all on sort of one page thing you don't have to uh, jump around to get to them. Just scroll all the way down to the bottom and then you go back to the top again. Now normally in one of these things I would just format it immediately. However, this is one that has a built-in memory on it. It's got a built-in 8 gigs on this camera, as well as the ability to use a card. Uh, so I had a look to see what was on the built-in memory, just in case, because I noticed it was switching on in the box as I was bringing it home. And there were a few pictures of the inside of the box. And also there was this little clip here, which is presumably from the uh, packing place. I'd be interested to see if anyone's able to translate this. Anyway, as I mentioned, my camera has got 8 gigs of built-in memory. The camera is available in a number of different configurations with and without the built-in memory. You select between the inner or the outer card and there's no overlap between them. They're completely separate. It doesn't fill one up and then fill the other one up when it's full or anything like that. Now, there's a reason that I wouldn't generally go for the built-in memory and it's because of the mount. This mount has got these little pins in it which attach to the little silver bits on the top of here. Uh, that's a connector that's going to wear out in time or fail if you repeatedly plug and unplug it over and over again. Now if you're using the built-in memory to get anything off the camera you're going to have to unplug it from the mount, take it into your house, plug in the USB lead and put it into your computer before you can get the footage off the camera itself. And then once you've finished with that, unplug that take it back, put it in your car and plug it back in again. As you can see, wear and tear. So what I would suggest instead, you might be better off using one with a micro SD card memory rather than the built-in memory. They're a little bit cheaper, although when I bought mine, there was only the version available with both. But I'd probably just forget the internal memory and stick to micro SD cards. Much easier to take in and out and less wear and tear on the camera's mount. Now I'll just go through some of the menus on this camera. First off, resolution. We've got a choice of three different resolutions we can shoot in. They're all 30 frames a second and we've got 1296p, 1080p and 720p. Now the quality menu lets us choose between three different qualities, super fine, fine and normal. All the clips in this video were shot with super fine mode. The exposure meter can be center or spot. All my clips were shot with center mode and WDR, wide dynamic range, on or off. Again, all my clips were shot with it on. Lane detection warning systems, I'm not interested in those. I didn't even try them out, straight past those. Uh, forget flicker, that's just messing around with a 60, 50 hertz thing. Uh, white balance, again, I just left it automatic on all my clips. Exposure value, I left them all at zero, uh, which I presume is automatic. Um, recycle, I set it to one minute when I was doing my clips just to make it easier to edit them, but you've got one, three, and five on here. Motion detection, uh, I'm not bothering with that. That would only really work if you had a car that didn't automatically start and stop the recording with the power. You'd use detection to spot when the car was moving. Uh, 
time setup. Uh, you can set the time in here. Now, of course, you've got a choice of having a GPS enabled mount or not. GPS mount will pull the time through from the GPS and you adjust it here with the up and down for the hours, depending on how far away you are from the GMT thingamajig, or you can set it manually there as well. Automatic power off, how long be before the camera powers off. This is how long before the screen goes off. I always have it set to one minute, so it goes off very quickly after setting off, so it doesn't annoy me. You've got a choice of what you want on the screen. Driver stamp, uh, time and date. Uh, the driver stamp you put in here. This is where you mess around with the characters until you put something on the screen that you want. Use the registration number. And then over the page here, we've got G sensitivity. Uh, you can mess around with that. I didn't bother. I tend to sort of ignore that or turn it off. I'm not sure which way is the best way to set that. You'd have to play around with that yourself. And then there's calibration for that as well. Uh, GPS on or off. Um, of course, I've got it on because I've got the GPS mount and velocity changing that into miles per hour from kilometers per hour because I prefer it. Uh, you can change everything back to default, format the card here, uh, choose whether you want to use the internal or the external card if you've got it. And that's it. So that's all the way around the menus and back to the beginning. Hold down the top one. We're back where we started. Now, if you press the top one, you notice there's a little mute at the top right there. There's a microphone and when you press it, it's supposed to mute the sound. I'll show you how the camera looks when mounted onto my car's windscreen, but it's a bit of an unusual situation because I've got it mounted next to the previous model so I could do some side-by-side -side comparisons. Now, if my car didn't have this dotted tinted ray section at the top, I'd be able to move the camera a little bit further up and more out of the way. One thing I don't like about those mounts is the fact that the adhesive pads have a grey backing on them that's quite noticeable from the exterior. Okay, I'll show you some sample clips next. The usual disclaimer applies that the YouTube clips won't look as good as the originals, and if you want to see the originals, you can download some from my website. There's a link in the description. Now, the weather might not stay fine during these tests, but the camera performed excellently, whatever the conditions. Now, the clips on the 0803 I split into one minute segments, and you've just gone past a join between two segments there that you won't have noticed because each of the segments is frame perfect to the next one. There's no overlapped or missing frames, so you can stitch them together. It'll look like one long video. Now, I tested this in all sorts of different conditions, day and night, sunny days, overcast days, going on in and out of trees, whatever I did, it worked perfectly well. One thing with this camera, though, it doesn't have any 60 frame per second modes. It's just got 30 frames per second. Now, the footage that you're looking at here was shot in a variety of 1296p and 1080p. I didn't use the 720p mode. I didn't see any point. Um, some people like 60 frames per second cameras because they like the idea that they could freeze a moment in time and get a nice sharp image. But I've tended to find on the 60 frame per second cameras that I've used, the 60 frame mode doesn't have enough bit rate and therefore ends up blockier than the 30 frame per second mode. So I prefer shooting at 30 frames per second anyway, so this camera is perfect for me. Now let's have a look at a few comparisons here. This is 1296p, I can only show it to you at 1080p. Uh, on this video because the whole video is in 1080p and then this is 1080p you can see that there's no difference in the field of view it looks the same the clouds move a bit but that's nothing to do with the camera now i'll do a zoom in to show you what it actually looks like in reality that's 1296p pay attention to the registration numbers and things and then we'll flip over to 1080p this is a crop remember and that uh, looks the same to me that's off a full frame image that i've cropped down before i put it into this editing package there's no difference i can't see anything different between 1296p and 1080p so um, you might as well just shoot in 1080p i think and save a bit more space on your memory card so you can fit more footage on it one thing i did notice moving the camera to this uh, down position so there's a little bit more dashboard in show actually improve the footage a lot more than messing around with the resolutions for example that's prior to me moving it and that's after you can see how much difference it makes just adjusting the camera down a little bit to get the exposure right. So you might find just getting the camera with a little bit more dashboard at the bottom where you think, well, I don't need that, but it does actually improve the image because it takes a little bit of the brightness out of the sky and the camera tends to focus more in a sort of central position to get its exposure right. But as you can see, it looks really nice. It's, uh, the sun's uh, come out, well, almost, and it looks nice and sharp during the daytime. Uh, one thing I'll do, I'll go around the uh, corner in a second and we can go and have a look at uh, going in and out of these trees because this is a good test for a camera. Sometimes these cameras don't like it when the exposure fluctuates wildly when you uh, start off in a bright area then go under trees. Also, 
quite often they go blocky and that was that thing I mentioned before about the low bit rates well I haven't had any issues with blocking on this camera uh, in areas where there's a lot of detail going on or the exposure having problems that's a semicircular red thing by the way that's the top of my dashboard console it's nothing to do with the camera now you saw at the beginning of the video that this camera puts in a really good performance in the dark as you can see now one thing it does have a bit of a problem with though is the sound quality there's a lot of sort of electronic buzz and noise comes through on the soundtrack so I'll play a little bit of that now so you can just have a listen to it so what we'll do now we'll uh, we'll go down this lane here where the light gets a little bit darker there's uh, the street lights are spaced a little bit further out so a little bit down here so you can see what the camera uh, how the camera copes in lower light and then I'll also take it down a, a lane that has no street lighting on it at all and we can have a look at that as well. So as you can hear the sound quality on this camera is probably its worst feature but it's not a deal breaker for me because I'm not that interested in recording sound on my dash cams. More often than not I'll have it muted but more about that later. However, as far as video quality goes, in conditions like this, when there's no street lights around, I've only got my full beam to light up the road, the camera is recording everything exactly as I saw it while I was driving along, and you can't ask for any more than that. So this camera performs excellently, whether it's night or day, cloudy or sunny, or going in and out of shadows. It's an excellent all-round dash cam. Now, if you connect this camera up to a computer via a USB lead, you'll find that it works like a memory card reader and I've got the internal and external SD cards showing up on my desktop. Whichever of those I go in, I've got the same four folders on them. The first one's full of videos, they're in the MOV format. Here are the um, stats for those videos. The 1296p is running at 20 to 22 megabits a second of variable bitrate and the 1080p is a 15 megabits a second constant bitrate. So whilst we're doing stats, I'll just mention a few others. Five minutes of 1296p video would take up 776 megabytes, or five minutes of 1080p would take up 587. The battery life, it's only 15 minutes or so. It's not really designed to be used on battery. It's supposed to be used on a power lead. The weight, 61 grams or 2.2 ounces. And again, that USB to 12 volt cable, it's about three meters or 10 feet long. Right, back to the contents of that SD card. Now remember, these folders will only appear if you format the card inside the camera itself. Now, if you've bought the camera with the optional GPS capable mount, inside the GPS folder, you'll find a load of log files. To play those back in conjunction with the video, go into the player folder and you'll find a piece of software in there called QT Player. Now that's just for Windows, so I couldn't use it because I'm using a Mac. Instead, I've gone online and downloaded a program from Earthshine Software called Dashcam Viewer. And it costs $10 for a full license, but it's well worth it because it works with lots of different dash cams. Now on the PC you've got alternatives as well. A lot of people really like a piece of software called Registrator Viewer. Anyway, regardless, whichever piece of software you decide to play back your files through, you're going to get a pretty similar result. You'll get uh, the video playing one part of the screen, you'll have a map on the other side that's pulling data through from uh, Google Maps, therefore you'll need to have an uh, internet capable PC that you're playing this on, and then you get other bits of data from your G sensors and the uh, speed of the car and the direction, things like that. Um, so there you go, that's what a piece of software looks like that will play back your GPS capable clips. Now this camera does have AV out capabilities. You'll need to supply your own lead for this, but if you do and plug it into the camera and into your television, you'll find that you're able to view a live feed from what the camera sees. And you can also go into the menus and select a video that you recorded earlier on and play that back on your TV screen. You'll have all the usual options. You can uh, play the video and you can fast forward and rewind and pause skip to the next one pretty much everything you'd need i did find that the video quality looked a little bit grainy though on the tv screen but it's perfectly fine really uh, for what it does now another thing you can do 
you can record as well as view live video. As you can see, I press record, we've got the red dot at the top there, and there's a red dot on the TV screen behind, which shows that I'm viewing and recording at the same time. However, notice the low battery warning flashing at the top middle there, it's just about to switch itself off. So if you plan on doing anything like that for a long period of time, I suggest you supply the camera with power. Now I did spot one bug on the camera, it's to do with the mute option. Press the top button, you get the mute come on, so it doesn't record the sound that the camera's hearing. You switch the camera off, next time you switch it back on again, it retains that setting, which is exactly what I want it to do. It shows that it's still muted. However, it isn't. Uh, after a reboot, it does start recording the sound again, even though it's showing that it isn't doing. So some of the footage where I'm talking about my favorite PIN numbers, uh, the password to my bank account, things like that, I've had to mute the soundtrack on those ones. I'd imagine that would be a pretty simple thing to fix with a firmware update. So just so you know, that's the firmware version that's on the camera that I'm testing. So it's time to sum up the pros and cons, and right at the top of the list of positives is the video quality. Excellent day and night, whatever the lighting conditions. The camera itself is very easy to use, it's ideal for somebody's first dash cam. It's small, and yet it's still got a screen on it. It's about as small as you can get a camera and have a sensible size screen that's easy to read. It's got that convenient mounting system which enables you to take the camera away but leave the wires in place and I haven't seen that on any other dash cam. On the negative side I do have some concerns about the longevity of the camera especially with regard to that internal battery that's going to wear out at some point and probably can't be replaced and those connectors which might wear down if you plug the camera in and take it out frequently. 1296p in my opinion is a gimmick it doesn't seem to offer anything over the quality of the 1080p footage. There's no 60 frames per second mode in this camera not a big deal to me but might be important to some people. The sound quality definitely isn't the best in this camera there's no getting over that and that mute bug that I mentioned at the end I'm pretty sure that can be resolved with a firmware update. So what's the best dash cam? That's the impossible to answer question that I get asked more than any other. The reason it's impossible is because I haven't tested every camera on the market. In fact, in the time I've been speaking to you, there's probably another 20 or so models come out. However, I can say for definite that out of all the cameras I've tested, the Mini 0803 is my favorite mini dash cam with a screen. Now, if you want to get hold of one of these, there's links to buy it in the video description from the place where I got mine from. There's also links up there to my blog where there's some downloadable samples and you can try those out for yourself and see if you can spot any difference between 1296p and 1080p. So that's the 0803 review. The original 0801 got a lot of things right first time and the 0803 just improves upon the areas in which the original camera was slightly lacking. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.